Hi, this is Daryl with Amazon Books, and today I've got a question for you. Is it okay to scalp a baseball ticket? Uh, what about selling advertising space on your forehead? And should companies be allowed to buy life insurance policies for their employees without them knowing about it? Uh, well, here to answer is uh, Michael Sandel, the Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University and the author of the new book, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. So, Professor Sandel, thanks for coming out. It's good to be here. Uh, so, would it be fair to say that your book is really trying to take a step back and say, well, maybe we shouldn't think about everything as a transaction? Yes. It's, it's noticing that we've shifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society, and that this is actually a big shift. A market economy, after all, is a tool. It's a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. But a market society is a place where almost everything is up for sale, and where we've been drifting in that direction, I think, for the past three decades or so. So we need, I think, to ask ourselves, where do markets serve the public good, and where do they not belong? Where might they crowd out other values and goods worth caring about? As you said, it's been really pervasive for three decades. Uh, I think people have been really taking notice since the recession, but it's actually been going on since the 80s. Is that right? Right. It's really over uh, three decades. I call it the, the rise of market triumphalism, the faith that markets are the primary instrument for achieving the public good. And I think the end of the Cold War had a lot to do with it. We felt that capitalism is the only system left standing, and we fell into the assumption that capitalism is just one thing, and that, ha that it has to do with using markets everywhere. I think this was a mistake, but the assumption runs very deep. And what's happened is that market values and market reasoning now have seeped into spheres of life, traditionally governed by other values. So it, markets not only govern the exchange of material goods, like flat screen televisions, but also personal relations, family life, education, health, national security, the way we think about civic life. And it's in those areas that I think we need to have a public debate about where markets belong and where they might erode important values. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the recession was really uh, the impetus to publish this book, or have you been kicking around these ideas for a long time? Well, I've been thinking about this and working on this uh, for, uh, well, for about 15 years. So wow. it was before the financial crisis. But I think that the financial crisis marked the end of uh, this period of unquestioned faith that markets can solve every social and human problem. And uh, there was a widespread sense, I think, after the financial crisis that markets and morals had become detached somehow from one another and that we needed to figure out how to reconnect them. And I think we're still groping to try to figure that out. So I do think it's a kind of uh, the financial crisis did mark an important moment, but we still have not really figured out how to, how to have a public debate about the role and reach of money and markets in our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I think one of the tensions of your book is, you know, there's this very dry and scientific language of economics and econometrics, right. and we don't really give it a second thought. So no. uh, how would you try and argue against it? Well, I would begin by looking case by case at very sometimes mundane examples from everyday life where market values now play a big role in ways that crowd out other values. Take the example of paying to go to the head of the line. Um, we take this more or less for granted now at the airport, let's say. There are these long lines at the security checkpoint. Now, routinely, you can buy your way to the head of the line to go through the security check, either by flying first class, or even if you're flying coach, the airlines will now sell you as an a la carte perk <laughs> the right to go to the head of the line mm -hmm. at amusement parks. When I was a kid, part of the experience of going to an amusement park meant waiting in line with everybody else from different walks of life at the popular rides. But now, in many amusement parks, you can pay more and you get line-cutting privileges. Mm -hmm. um, and now, at amusement parks and airports, we may think, well, this is hardly the, the biggest moral problem <laughs> face, facing the republic. 
but they're small examples of a bigger pattern where more and more and more areas of life, including education and healthcare and military service, civic life, it's possible to use money to jump to the head of the line. Mm -hmm. This is your ethic of the queue versus the ethic of the market. Yes, and uh, take the example of immigration, which is one of the most fraught, controversial questions in our politics. Who should come, how many should come, on what basis? Uh, we have a lottery to allocate some green cards every year, and, and then there are other criteria. Uh, one very famous free market economist, Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker from the University of Chicago said, he had a simple solution. Simply sell the right to immigrate to the United States. Use the market to decide. Charge 50000 or $100,000, and it's a way of avoiding all of these controversial questions about who should come and on what basis. Well, do we want to put citizenship or the right to reside in the U.S. up for sale, up for auction? Now, that, that's a question of paying to jump to the head of the line that's more consequential than getting to the head of the line at the amusement park. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of debate I think we need to have. Do we want market mechanisms to decide those questions, or should other, other values govern? Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the proposed immigration market. Uh, right. What do you think is, are some of the more shocking examples of transactions and potential sales that people will find in your book? Well, uh, here's one about line cutting. On Capitol Hill, I didn't know this until I did the research for the book, there are a limited number of seats, public seats, to attend congressional hearings or to attend Supreme Court arguments in big cases. Now, lobbyists want to attend the congressional hearings, but they don't want to stand on a line for a day or sometimes two, three days, sometimes out in the rain. So there are line standing companies now in Washington <laughs> that they can hire the companies hire homeless people or others to stand and wait in the line. And just before the hearing begins, the lobbyist comes, claims his or her place in the line, and goes into the hearing room. And the same f to, to hear the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So essentially, we are allowing ticket scalping, um, like you have at the World Series or outside a popular concert, to gain access even to a congressional hearing. That I found pretty shocking. The other m most shocking to me was body advertising. People now sell space on their forehead, for example, to companies who want to advertise there. There's one, one woman um, who sold for $10,000 advertising space on her forehead. She installed a permanent tattoo for $10,000, and the winning bid came from an online casino. <laughs> she will go through the rest of life advertising the online casino on her forehead. For only $10,000. There you go. So uh, at several points throughout the book, you talk uh, about people like Gregory Mankiw and Larry Summers. Uh, at one point, you even say, economists don't like gifts. Uh, so after all these assaults on the econo uh, economic and econometric way of thinking, do you still have friends who are economists? <laughs> I do. Some of my best friends are economists, even rather imperialistic economists. <laughs> and part of what I try to show in the book is not only have markets extended their reach in recent decades, economics has changed. I went back and looked at a textbook by Paul Samuelson, uh, written in the late 1950s to see how he defined economics. His was the most popular introductory economics textbook. And he defined economics by its subject matter. Uh, prices, inflation, unemployment, the stock market, foreign trade, that sort of thing. Then I looked at one of the most popular introductory economics textbooks today by my friend and colleague, Greg Mankiw. And he defines an economy as simply the way people interact in a society as they go about their lives. This is a big change, and it's happened over this period of about three decades. Economics has become more abstract and more ambitious. It aspires to explain everything, not just 
not just foreign trade and inflation and unemployment and depressions and recessions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But once economics aspires to explain everything from how people decide whether or not to stay married to a, their partner, which is one example from Gary Becker, or um, whether to educate themselves or how to educate their children. Once economics reaches into all spheres of life, it's very hard to think of it, as economists like to think of it, as a value-neutral science. Because if it's true that market relations sometimes crowd out non-market values, then we have to ask moral questions, normative questions, about where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, where they may, may crowd out non-market values, which means economics, once it, once it reaches beyond the material sphere of goods, can no longer think of itself as a value-neutral discipline. It has to become a, what it once was back in the days of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, mm -hmm. a subfield of moral and political philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it very uh, shocking and interesting that you use words like corruption yeah. uh, and these very charged words to describe what I previously thought of as just a very kind of benign scientific way of thinking. Well, take, take a, a small but important example of motivating um, students in schools, elementary schools and high schools, to achieve academically. A lot of uh, cities have tried experiments led often by economists to use cash incentives to try to get students to get better grade, to motivate students to get better grades, better test scores. They've tried this in New York, in Washington, in Chicago. In Dallas, they pay third graders two dollars for each book they read. <laughs> now, suppose you were the superintendent, Daryl will make you the <laughs> <laughs> of a of a school and an economist came to you with this proposal. These kids are not achieving. Here's a way to motivate them. Pay them money for good grades or to read books. What, what would be your first response? Would you go for it? Uh, it sounds a little fishy to me. And, and why? Why would you hesitate? Because it seems like you shouldn't have to pay them, that they should understand that you know, it's, it's just required to get a good grade and it's not something that you should be motivated by money to do. It seems more like it's reducing it to a transaction. Right. And but I've read your book, so. All right, so you're, you're already tainted <laughs> so. by these, these thoughts. I mean, some people would say, look, we've got to try something. These kids are not motivated by the love of learning, at least not yet. They don't come from homes that, that encourage them uh, academically. So we need something to jumpstart the learning and maybe the real reason will take once you get them reading. But others would, and, and I would share your hesitation, and I think that the root of the hesitation is the thought that we may actually, by paying kids to read books, even if they read more books, we may be teaching the wrong lesson. And when the money stops, maybe so will the reading and maybe they will be learning to regard reading as a chore, as a form of piecework that you do because you're paid, and never really learn love of learning or reading for its own sake. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to know what will, in, in most of these experiments, the results have been mixed. In the New York City schools, it did not work to improve grades or test scores. In Dallas, the, it did lead to uh, the kids reading more books, the $2, mm -hmm. though the books became shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we don't know what will happen to these kids over time when they're no longer being paid. And what, what this dilemma illustrates is that sometimes a cash incentive or a market relationship can crowd out or corrupt the attitudes toward learning, in this case, and reading that we are ultimately aiming at. And so to decide whether to pay kids to read books as a way of jump-starting their learning, we have to engage not only in a calculation of economic efficiency, but also in a normative judgment about what attitudes and values do we want to cultivate in these kids and what will be the effect 
of a market uh, relationship, a cash incentive on those attitudes. Hmm. So have you found any economists who are getting on board with you? Well, there is a lot of orthodoxy among many mainstream economists. And they tend to insist, and I've had friendly debates with a, a number of economist friends, they tend to insist that economics is a science of efficiency and that it doesn't deal one way or the other with moral questions. But there are other economists, more heterodox economists, often the ones who are more oriented toward actual empirical studies of how the world works and how people respond to incentives, who notice this crowding out effect, who realize that when economic incentives, cash incentives, enter social life and personal relations and education, that sometimes non-market values are corrupted or crowded out. And uh, one example of this is in Switzerland, they were trying to figure out where to locate a nuclear waste site. They identified a town, a small town in the mountains. They had to get the approval, though, of the people living there, and no one wants a nuclear waste site in their backyard. They said, would you be willing, if the parliament identified your town, would you be willing to accept it? Fifty-one percent said yes. <laughs> then they asked a follow-up question. They sweetened the deal. They said, suppose your town is chosen and the government offers a cash incentive every year to every resident of the town for accepting this burden. Then would you accept it? And, well, you've read the book. You know what <laughs> happened. Uh, the number willing to accept it did not go up. It went down. Mm. In fact, it was cut in half from 51 to 25 percent. Wow. Now, by standard economic analysis, this is a paradox. Normally, when you offer money to people to do something, their willingness to do that thing goes up. Mm -hmm. Here it went down. What happened, I think, is that the monetary offer crowded out the motivation that led the majority to, to accept the nuclear waste site in the first place. They were willing to do it out of a sense of civic duty, public responsibility. The waste has to go somewhere. This seems to be the safest place. They'll do it for the sake of the common good. But then once it became a financial transaction, they said, well, no, we, we won't be bought for $8,000 a year, whatever it was. And they asked the people, they said, who changed their minds, they said, we, we didn't want to be bribed. Huh. So as economists study cases like this and notice how cash incentives sometimes can make people less willing, not more willing, to accept a burden or a sacrifice for the sake of the common good, those more empirically minded economists, I think, are broadening the, the boundaries of economics in ways that are hospitable to the kinds of moral arguments that I'm trying to bring to bear on economics in the book. Hmm. And at the very end of your book, you ask, do we want a society where everything is for sale? Now, for those of us who aren't uh, either economists or philosophers, right. uh, what would you say? How can we make that known? Well, I think that for citizens generally, the, the biggest and most far-reaching effect of the commodification of everything is that the more money can buy, especially at a time of rising inequality, those who are affluent and those of modest means increasingly live separate lives. Uh, we look up and we find that we, we live and work and shop and play in different places. Our children go to different schools. So there's a separation in ways of life between the affluent and the, and the less affluent. And this happens in part because of rising inequality, but also because money can buy more and more in the society. More hangs on how much money you have. And this is not good for democracy. I call it the skyboxification of American life. Th those who can retreat to skyboxes and don't share the common space 
of democratic citizenship. And so this is something I think, uh, well, it's something that worries me. It's, and the question is, does putting everything up for sale contribute to society where we encounter one another less and less in the ordinary course of life? I think those of us who inhabit the skyboxes, so to speak, even occasionally, would prefer to share in public spaces, like good public schools or good public transportation, where we and our children can encounter and bump up against people from all walks of life and social backgrounds. Um, and this is what democracy really requires, that there be shared spaces of democratic citizenship. There are fewer and fewer places like that today. And so I think we need to step back as a society and say, do we want to live like this? The, the, the question of markets ultimately, I think, is not only an economic question. It's really a question of uh, what kind of common life do we want to live together? And if we care about democracy, I think we have to have this debate. Mm -hmm. All right. Professor Sandel, thanks so much for coming over. Thank you, Daryl. All right. Thanks a lot. Really good. Yeah. This is fun.